They came to the other side of the lake, to the country of the Gerasenes, and when he, Jesus, had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. This man lived among the tombs, and no one could restrain him anymore, even with a chain. For he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart and the shackles he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed before him, and he shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. He begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there on the hillside, a great herd, a herd of swine was feeding. And the unclean spirits begged Jesus, Send us into the swine, let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned in the water. The swine herds ran off and told it in the city and in the country, and then people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there, now clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had been the legion. And they were afraid. They were afraid. Those who had seen what had happened to the demoniac and to the swine reported it, and then they began to beg Jesus to leave the neighborhood. And as he was getting into the boat, a man who had been possessed by demons begged him, who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might go with him. But Jesus refused and said, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what his mercy has shown you. And when he went away, he began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. You know, one of the things I love about Scripture and why I love studying it is because you can take one text and look at it in lots of different ways. I can read a text and see one truth in it, and you can read the same text and read a completely different truth in it, and they both can be true. They don't exclude each other. Or I can read a text when I'm 15 and find something meaningful in it, and I can read it again when I'm 65 and find something completely different And both of those can stand alone. We call that a surplus of meaning. And most texts in the Bible are like that. They have a surplus of meaning. It's why we like to do Bible study together, because it's helpful if we hear different points of view from each of us. We're helping each other understand the surplus of meaning that's in a text. And this story today has a definitely has a surplus of meaning. There are a lot of ways to think about this text. By the way, don't ever try to tell me the Bible is boring. This is not a boring story. This could easily be a plot point in a Game of Thrones episode. This is a very strange story. There, here's this guy who is possessed, of, in one way we read the story, he's possessed of multiple evil spirits and they've taken over his body such that nobody can control him. And the townspeople have tried to help. He, he spends his day howling and running around naked and cutting and bruising himself with rocks. And they've tried to even wrap chains around him to try to stop him from hurting himself and other people. But it hasn't worked. He's just broken free of these chains and they can't do anything with him. So they've allowed him to just live in the cemetery, in the tombs. And he just runs around doing this all day howling and cutting himself until Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up in this Gentile territory where this man lives and he comes and he calls out these evil spirits, these demons that live within him. And as he does, he says, what's your name? They say Legion. And they don't want to leave the area. They ask Jesus for permission to stick around and just go into a herd of swine. And so that's what happened. They go into a herd of swine and then what what do the pigs do? They immediately rush down the bank into the water and they drown themselves. The demons are gone. The man is healed. Praise God. Now, if you were up here today preaching this text, what you might say is, now you see what we learned from this text today is that just like this man, all of us have personal demons. 
All of us have things inside us that we struggle with personally, whether it's an addiction or um, negative feelings about ourselves or other people or negative attitudes. And if we allow the, the power of the love and grace of God to come to us through Jesus Christ, we too can be exercised of those demons and live a life where we're a whole person again. You could preach that sermon. It's a completely valid way to look at this text and preach this text, but that is not the sermon I'm going to preach to you today. Although, actually, I sort of just did, didn't I? So <laughs> you're, getting, you're getting two for one today. But there is another way to look at this text that's very different. Um, the, the way I just did it for you is sort of an Americanized Christian way of reading Scripture. In American Christianity, we tend to think uh, of the way we follow Jesus being very personal and very private. It's a lot of it's about dealing with myself and my relationship with God through Christ. It's about getting my heart right. It's about my personal salvation. We talk about that a lot in American Christianity, that really the, the focus of American Christianity is personal salvation. But there is another way to read this text that probably is closer to the way the people who originally heard it read it, which is not to read it privately um, and within our own hearts, but to read it corporally, publicly, to read it in a way that involves all of us at the same time. And in this way of reading the text, we are possessed. The scripture is telling us we are possessed. There is still that in the story. But in this version of the story, what we're possessed by is not some private demon. We are possessed by the empire. Dum, dum, da dum, dum, da dum, dum, da dum. Some of you recognize that as a theme song from Star Wars, right? That's where we get our notions from empire today. And really, Star Wars gets it right about what the empire was like. So let's think about this. And by the way, this way of reading the text I'm about to share with you, I really am in debt here to a couple of scholars that I, I admire. Uh, Ched Myers is one of them. John Dominic Crossan is another. And they have said that in this, this new way of looking at the text that opens it up to a more communal way of thinking about this story, they say where you want to particularly pay attention to is the moment in the story where Jesus tells the demons to come out of the man and says, by the way, what's your name? And it says... I am legion, for we are many. Now, in the way we normally read this text, we just think that means, well, there's a lot of demons in this guy. But they say, no, no, no. Take this guy at his word. He says the demon within him is legion. Now, people in the first century listening to this story, Mark's audience knew immediately, legion, that's what you call a gathering of 2,000 Roman soldiers. What this guy is telling us, what he's possessed by, is Roman imperial domination. That's what possesses him. That's what tears him apart, keeps him from being the person he's supposed to be. He's possessed by this challenge that all people living under Roman domination had, which was either I go over here and I do what the empire tells me to do and I lose my soul, or I go over here and I try to work against the empire and maybe I lose my life. And that choice tore people apart. It was like competing voices in their head. They lost who they were. That's what's going on in this story today that, that these two scholars say, this man, who maybe represents all the Jewish people, is possessed by Roman imperial domination. The people that lived under Roman domination, particularly the Jews, had their culture ripped away from them. They were forced to live in poverty. They had almost no freedom. They had lost their souls, basically, to the Roman Empire. They were possessed by the Roman Empire. Now, if you think this interpretation is a stretch, let me go one step further. What's the setting for this story? You remember? We're in a cemetery. We're amongst the tombs. Now, Mark's audience listening to the story, they would have clicked on that immediately. They would remember, ah, the place where he set this story, right before Mark writes his gospel, there had been this event happen. There had been a, a revolt of Jewish people in this area, Jewish rebels, and the, uh, the, the Roman Empire had sent in an army to stop the rebellion. They had killed a thousand young men. They had taken the women and children away into slavery. And they had burned the city to the ground. They had turned the city into a graveyard. And that's the setting for the story today. Mark's audience is clicking into this. The setting for the story is a place that Rome has turned into a graveyard. And that's where this man lives. So what happens then? Jesus shows up. He comes out of the boat. He's coming out of Jewish territory into um, Gentile territory. And Jesus heals the man. And what happens when he brings the, the demons out of him, brings legion out of the man? Where do they go? Into pigs. 
Matter of fact, Mark says they go into a herd of pigs. Now, here's a problem. We do not call a collection of pigs a herd. That's not what you call a collection of pigs. And Mark knows that too. So why does he use, in Greek, the word for herd? Well, Mark knows, that his audience knows, that a group of new Roman recruits were called a herd. Ah, so here's what Jesus has done. He's exercised Roman imperial domination, legion from this man. He has sent them into the most unclean animal that the Jewish people can think of, a pig. And then this herd, what do they do? They rush down to the sea and they are drowned. And then Mark's audience goes, oh, and they're leaning over each other going, oh, that's just like when Moses opened the waters of the sea and the Egyptians that oppressed our ancestors went across and they were drowned and ended the oppression of the Egyptians. It's the same thing. This is why it's always good to read scripture within the context, historically, and culture of the people that wrote it. They're hearing all kinds of things that maybe we wouldn't catch in the text. So here's a different way of thinking about it. So Jesus has now let this man free He said, you don't have to choose anymore. You can be the person God created you to be. You can stop listening to all the voices. You can be whole again. You can stop being part of the empire, and you can start being a citizen of the kingdom of God. And in that, he finds new life. He finds liberation. Now, you would expect that the townspeople would be thrilled with this, right? This guy, they tried to help, and they couldn't. Now he's free. He's liberated. But what is their reaction? They're angry. They're fearful. They want to exercise Jesus. They say, get out of town. We don't need you here. Because why? They're really upset that he just ran all these pigs down into the water. This is their livelihood. You see, Jesus is sort of saying in the story, at least the text is saying, you have a choice. You can belong to the economy of the empire. You can belong to the economy of the kingdom of God. Now, the truth is, if we were the people living under Roman imperial domination, even if we were the people at the bottom who were the most oppressed, we still probably benefited from the economy that Rome brought. If there were Roman troops living in our area who needed stuff, we could benefit from that. And so here's the story saying, well, if you decide to be part of the kingdom, you might have to let that go. Here's Jesus saying, you can choose to belong to the economy of the empire, which might be benefiting you, but it's an economy based on occupation, on oppression and violence. Or you can belong to the economy of the kingdom of God, which is based in nonviolence and compassion, particularly for the marginalized. Which do you choose? Well, I don't know about you, but between those two choices, it's a lot easier to say no to the peaceful Jesus than it is to say no to the powerful empire. I mean, just think about our own society. We think about people who were, say, um, growing crops of cotton back in the days of slavery. We're told that even some of these people who owned slaves knew it was wrong, said it was wrong, understood it was probably dehumanizing these people, and yet what? They still did it. They still owned slaves because they were part of an economy that relied on slavery, and they just said, that's the way it is. We have to participate in that economy. Or we think of people today who grow crops like tobacco, to meet the needs of their family, but they know that some corporation is going to take that product, that that crop, and turn it into a commodity that's going to cause lung cancer in people. Or we think about the exploitation of people in the third world, workers in the third world who are making products cheaply so that we don't have to pay so much for our clothes or for our our iPhones and and our iPads. Or we think about corporations that exploit the environment because it's good for the bottom line. Or you could take the healthcare system that we have in this country that's really based more in the profits for the people at the top than it is based in the need of the people who are actually receiving the health care. When you're part of the economy of the empire, it's very hard to extricate yourself out of it. When the empire possesses every piece of your daily life, from how you vote to how you spend your money to what you do for a living to where you go to church, all of that, it's hard to, to say, yeah, Jesus, let me out of that. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, Brian, aren't you getting a little political today? Right? Can't you stick with a version of the story where it's just about me personally, about my own personal heart, about, you know, I've got some things in my life I need to fix, and Jesus can bring me free from that. 
You know, often we say, you know, politics have no place in the church, right? You know, Jesus wasn't political, the church should not be political. But I don't know how anybody reads the Gospels and comes to the conclusion that Jesus was not political. I mean, absolutely, Jesus was concerned about our private hearts, our private lives, and, and cared about the, the things that are happening to us interpersonally. But, but Jesus, make no doubt about it, Jesus was a harsh critic of the political system of his day, of the social systems of his day. He was a, a, a radical troublemaker when it comes to that. In fact, we know well from the story, it was not Jesus' teachings about peace and love that get him killed. It was Jesus' indictment, his critique, his willingness to publicly critique the power of the Roman Empire that end up getting him hung on a cross. So what does this mean for us? I guess it depends if you really take seriously the way these two scholars are reading this story. And whether or not you think that in some way, those of us still living in a world that is dominated by all kinds of empires, are we in any way affected by those in our daily lives? Are we still in some way possessed by empire? And is there anything we can do about it? You notice in the story that the guy wants to go with Jesus, but what does Jesus tell him to do after he's been healed? Stay here. Don't leave the empire. You're still going to be in the empire. You're just not of it anymore. So what would that look like for us? If we said we're, we're going to live in the empire, but we're not going to live of the empire. We're going, to, we're going to be in the economy of the empire, but we're not going to participate in the economy of the empire. What, what does that look like for, for us as individuals? Or what would that look like for us as a church? Well, I, I want to close just by throwing out one little tiny example that maybe will spark something in your thinking this week. It was a, a little video. It was 30 seconds long that I've seen multiple times on Facebook. This video is of a little boy who can't be more than like three years old. And it's his birthday. And he's standing outside with some family members and they have a pinata for him. And the pinata is as tall as he is and it's Spider-Man. And they gave him a stick. And what's he supposed to do with the stick? Whack Spider-Man until he cracks open and gives him his reward of all that candy. But here's the thing. This little boy loves Spider-Man. Spider-Man is his hero. He loves Spider-Man. So here is a Spider-Man, as tall as he is, standing right in front of him, and they're giving him a stick and saying, all you got to do for that thing you love is whack it until it breaks open and you'll be rewarded. So he takes the stick in the video, and as gently as he can, he taps Spider-Man on the shoulder. You can see the anguish in this kid's face. And he taps it again. Then he drops the stick, and he goes over and he hugs Spider-Man and puts his head on Spider-Man's shoulder. I imagine that's what it looks like to be in the empire, but not of the empire. And I imagine that this story we hear today is not just a story for people long ago, but it's a story for us today. We have that same choice too. Let's pray.